In this episode of the OIS Retina Podcast, Dr. Firas Rehal has a candid conversation with industry leader Paul Hallen, the global head of surgical retina at Alcon. Let's listen in. Hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the OIS Retina Podcast. This is our third official podcast after the kickoff earlier uh, last month. This is again for us for Hall. I'm a vitreous retinal surgeon in Los Angeles, a part of Retina Vitreous Associates, and I'm also a partner at Excite Ventures, a small venture capital firm uh, out of New York that uh, invests solely in ophthalmology. And I'm happy to have and delighted to have as my guest today, uh, Paul Hallen, who is an old friend of mine and anyone who's been in retina over the last two or three decades, of course, knows Paul and his colleagues at at Alcon. Paul has been with Alcon for many years. I want to hear a little bit about that history, but he's currently the global head of glaucoma and retina. Uh, And I've known about the retina part. I think the glaucoma part is more recent. We'll, We'll ask Paul about that. Um, I want to just, Paul, for a minute, go into your history that I'm aware of, and then I, I'd like you to talk to it, speak to it a little yourself. Thanks, I was man. happy to see that you're a Cal Poly man, because that is one of my favorite parts of the country. And, and, and as we were discussing before, you didn't know this about me, but I lived in that area for about three years. And I think it's, uh, they call it God's country. I, I'm not, uh, I don't know that I would go that far, but it's pretty beautiful. And I understand then you went to USC and got your master's degree. Right. And you've been at Alcon now nearly 30 years or maybe over 30 years? Yeah, 30, 31. Who's counting? Yeah. Who's counting? Yeah, we lost <laughs> count after 20, I think. Uh, yeah. I know that you have been in so many different facets, but I was, I didn't know that you started out as an engineer with them. And then I know that you've been in the other things you've been involved in, marketing, product development, sales. And I know you to be also involved in acquisitions innovation and that's the part you know we're obviously want to hear about from you but all the parts uh maybe you could tell us a little bit about your personal history at alcon or before uh, in other capacities and and how that development has gone for you going from one department to the next and growing your career within the company yeah well you know i started in engineering and always had a love for innovation and uh i was in manufacturing engineering quality engineering and just didn't you know, really feel like that's where I belonged. And I, I really liked marketing and uh, the retina area at Alcon was complex enough to try to convince them to let an engineer come into marketing because it's mostly a uh, business people with much better personalities than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, you defy the, uh, the engineering kind of uh, stigma. You actually have a very bubbly and gregarious personality. Uh, Maybe, but uh, anyway, so I really loved innovation. I want to get into marketing and they gave me a chance because this, this area with really smart, brainy surgeons and uh, very complex procedures and technologies, I was able to convince them to get in and uh, really ran into the best job in the world with all the, the global impact, the technology, the creativity. It's just, uh, it's been really great, I think. So, um that was in about 1992, joined the marketing group, and really the goal was to develop the Acurus system. And that took some time, took about five years, the Acurus being the precursor to the Constellation, and really the first integrated vitretinal machine out of, out of Alcon. In the meantime, we started assembling all the pieces. There was a gentleman named Scott Manning, and he was really kind of the executive architect behind Alcon getting into retina. Um, so we picked up the expansile gases, uh, the perfluoron and laser probes at Infinitech, and um, also the silicone oil from Richard James. Then we brought in the Acurus console and really surrounded that with all the products. Uh, we then acquired Greasehopper, and you can see how that started to shape things. And then since then, basically, we've just been improving every part of that, right? And I think, you know, to do great surgery, you need three things. You need a great surgeon like yourself or, or David Boyer, um, but you need great surgical tools. So we spent a lot of time, you know, optimizing cut speed, fluidics, all these different things that were needed by the retina specialist. And then lastly, you know, you need great visualization. So that comes along a little, little bit later on in the story here, but that led to the ingenuity in, in digital 3D viewing. But that's kind of the, uh, the basics, and, and the philosophy is this. Take care of the patient, number one, right? Number two, 
take care of the surgeon, right? They're your customer. And I, and I think, you know, together that makes Alcon go forward and eventually that makes the individual such as myself move forward in the organization. So I think that's really kind of the secret to, to success. It's funny you mentioned those two things because uh, you, you anticipated some comments and questions I wanted to get to, but let's do it now. Um, okay. I've, I've always appreciated the culture at Alcon and I've always viewed it and I've been a consultant uh, and obviously I've been a surgeon for a long time and have interacted with your company directly on the ground for 25 plus years. Um, I've always found the people to be transparent and, and straight and uh, honest about the products and honest about their goals. And that's very refreshing. And I also came to the same conclusion in my thoughts in preparing to talk to you, which is that Alcon does view the patient and the doctor in that order, or maybe not in that order. And I, I've seen that. And I, I think that is the case. Is that culture what drove you to stay there? so long. I mean, there's not a lot of people staying places 30 years anymore, as you know. Now, Alcon does have some guys who've been there a long time. How do you view the culture there? What has that taught you? Or what about it do you love? Yeah, well, I think, number one, it starts with what you're bringing up, the integrity of, of, of the company. So if you don't believe in the company, then you're going to find yourself looking for another, another job. And then the mission, as we've kind of stated, helping people see, uh, you know, does it get better than that, right? Um, so that's the basis for why would I go anywhere else? I'm at Alcon, helping people see better. It just, you know, there's, there's nowhere to go from there, right? So people stay and, you know, high integrity of the company and the, the amount of innovation investment that we do, it, it allows you to do some of the things that you want to accomplish. And so I think all those things, uh, and, you know, and the leadership having basically very supportive uh, and appropriate risk taking is is really uh, you know refreshing. Your history there, and it, actually we have sort of commensurate histories in terms of how long we've been in the business. I was a resident and fellow in the early '90s, so we kind of have the same observation period of this field. And it I, it turns out from learning about you, you you were a bit of an appreciator of history of the specialty as well. And I am too. And I remember being a resident fellow and, and holding those newly uh, developed Avi lenses for Stanley Chang, my first and greatest mentor and using the perfluorocarbon liquid, which didn't have a name yet in big vats that we used to refer to as Stanley's juice. And somehow I still call it that when I ask Willie to hand it to me, I say, give me the juice. And he knows what I'm talking about. You've had the, this catbird seat of the history of our specialty. And some of our younger colleagues may not be aware how young this specialty is. It really hasn't existed all that long. Your career has spanned a lot of these recent advances. What do you see in your 30 years as the, some of the great highlights historically of developments or even uh, personalities or persons that you consider consequential in that run? Yeah, I think number one, history can help you predict the future, right? So I'd go all the way back to, you can say the beginning was way back when, when they did the first vitrectomy, but I think it, the technology started evolving probably, you know, before my time in 1983, when Charles and Wong came out with the disposable 20 gauge vet pro, right? Yeah, and of course. That's a, that's a huge thing. Cause if, if you really think about what the surgeons had to go through in reassembling the vet probes every time, they were mechanical and probably not as reliable. Um, and they were very large gauge, you know, like 18 gauge. And so the 20 gauge disposable vet probe was really kind of the modern beginning, right? So then I joined in about 89, got into marketing and, and development in, in 92. Um, and was around a lot of people, like I've mentioned, Scott Manning and, and uh, David Lancaster, if you knew him. Um, yeah, I knew David. Guys. And <clears throat> there was a surgeon, Travis Meredith, that you may know, came to us and said, hey, you guys need some help. Uh, you're the right company, um, but let us help you figure out how to develop essentially the accuracy. And so we were very much um, starting off from the point of listening to surgeons and getting their advice and their feedback along the way, which allowed us to become 
I think really surgical anthropologists, really understanding what is needed, right? And then, you know, going to surgery a lot and, you know, really examining the details of what a David Boyer does or a Stanley Chang or a Stan Rizzo or a Steve Charles. And, and then asking a lot of questions. And I think, you know, we'll get into innovation a little bit later, but that's the essence of it. You know, then after the Acuras, you know, we started building on that platform. Uh, and then really, you know, things just moved along until Dewan, you know, brought out MIVs right around right 2000. And, uh, you know, I think surgeons now don't realize how before the Acuras, it was really a joke in terms of the surgery. Acuras kind of established that, but MIVs really moved it forward uh, on our platform as well as the other companies. Um, and at that same time, because I had been involved with uh, Gene Dewan and Retina Labs, I watched MIVs from Hopkins be developed. And so it became very apparent to me when I got back to Alcon in 2001, because I was gone for a couple of years, that we need to go to disposable grease hopper instruments. And those have, you know, really improved things as well. So that was another kind of important step uh, in moving into those instruments. And then really, then it was about elevating that whole game by going to Constellation and going from, you know, 800 cuts per minute on the Acris to now, 20,000 and giving you all that control to make you really do better surgery, but do it more confidently, more deliberately. And in that time, really the procedures used to be, as you may recall, because you're, you're kind of old, but <laughs> they, they were like, you know, I mean, you've been in three hour cases, right? Three and a half. Hours. Yeah. And it was actually 600 cuts when I was uh, cutting my teeth. That's for right. Quite some time. And, it's funny you were talking about that. For me, the MIVs, uh, uh, the small gauge surgery change for me is the biggest one of all these things. And they're all so great and wide angle viewing phenomenal. I'm yes. a big Avi Lens fan, as you might know, uh, the gases and the liquids all tremendous. But the, 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 the small incision surgery really was a game changer and the cut rate is the game changer. And now when I turn down the cut rate to say, uh, take up some solid tissue, you know, slow things down. And I say, Hey, Willie, cut it down to 2,500. It sounds like a slow engine. And I don't even know what 600 would sound like anymore, but that is how we fixed them for many years. Well, you mentioned Willie. He's the number one scrub in the world. You know, man, we agree 100% on that. And I, I'm going to play this for Willie at some point, I'm sure. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear that from oh, you in hello. particular. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting. Going back to the history, you know, um, again, that informed cut rate because when you were cutting at 600 cuts per minute, that was, was only because it didn't work at 800, yeah. right? And yeah. so there's been a, that's a tremendous line of innovation going on there. Engage also. So those are two historical things. And when I say now, hey, let's really optimize 27 gauge. I mean, at every point in history, somebody said, oh, you know, 1,200 cuts per minute is fast enough. Uh, no, it's not. Right? Yeah. Every time it comes up and you're smiling because yeah. I've probably been guilty of this too. And maybe if I have been to you, you'll hide it from our audience. But you, you, somebody will say, hey, we're going to go to 7,500. And I remember thinking at 5,000, yeah. come on, really? I mean, is that really going to make that much of a difference? And sure enough, it did. And 10,000 was an advance that was noticeable and detectable. And I just recently did a 20,000 speed case uh, yeah. with you guys, with Nick. Grillo, I'll give him a plug here. A yeah. great, greatest rep ever. Great sales rep. Love Nick. Fantastic guy. A typical Alcon transparency, uh, uh, straightforward, comes when you need him. And the 20,000 was amazing. And it's convincing me to do more 25 gauge. I'm a 23 gauge user uh, historically, but it really makes the 25 gauge just as fast, at least in those cases that I did. Yeah. You know, and I go to surgery a lot, but I'll tell you, um, it's really great to have people like Nick, uh, his boss, Ed Gibson, who you also probably know. And, yeah, and of course. Scott, Clausen, great guy. Scott Clausen, people like that. When I don't know, I either call someone like you or Dr. Rizzo or Dr. Charles almost every day. 
Um, but I'll call these guys to get their perspective in there. You know, they're very experienced and, and why not? They go to surgery a lot more than I do. And I go a lot. So uh, they're, they're, in, they're incredibly uh, knowledgeable and uh, deserve a lot of credit for that. Let's, let's move to innovation since we're talking yeah. about these great uh, innovations, more sort of theoretically speaking, since you've, you've been in the back rooms, you've seen the sausage being made, uh, you've right. been a participant in that. Tell us, take us through some of the innovation process in-house versus acquisition and how you judge those different tree branches and what you do in either of those situations. Right, I, I think it all starts in the operating room. And again, like I said, being a surgical anthropologist, observing, asking questions of one surgeon going to another operating room, asking the same questions. And you start building up this, you know, catalog or Wikipedia of really what are the main issues. And then we set about by improving those issues, you know, relentlessly, like you said, you know, uh, 800, 1500, you know, 2,500, 5,000, 7,500, 10,000. We just are relentless in doing that. Um, Meanwhile, doing the same thing with gauges, but also, you know, improving the fluidics, um, you know, simple things like getting rid of the stopcocks. If you remember, there used to be two stopcocks on the field, one for vacuum and one for infusion. Yeah. And they were three position. So do the permutations. Um, someone's going to make a mistake. Um, I'm not sure I know how to use those things. I love that somebody else can do it. So you got to pay attention to ease of use and innovation. So yeah. having, a, having two vacuum lines, so there's no stopcock there. And then going to an automated stopcock where we just basically use pressure differential to select fluid or air. And, you know, it, it simplifies things and it shortens the procedure. We call these velocity features. We keep find, trying to find ways for priority number two, and that's to help the surgeon, right? Number one's patient. Number two is help the surgeon do things faster, do them easier, more consistently. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. We go, you know, almost 30 years and we think, hey, maybe we should bevel the probe to the shape of the retina, right? Yeah. People love it. Uh, you look at, and again, it's about finding that unmet need. And you look at things like the shark skin ILM forceps, having those nano teeth at the distal end, you know, it's, it, you know, grabbing the ILM tissue without putting too much normal or vertical force on the retina and causing the blanching and so forth. You know, it, I think it just makes your job easier. You can probably do that faster. And those are just a few examples of really trying to understand what the problems are from the surgeons that hopefully also uh, affect the patient outcomes better. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of getting in and out of, out, out of the eye faster. And of course, you know, when we started like, you know, three, three and a half hours. And now what's your average case time now? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah. So, it, it, truthfully, it's a little less when you remove the really hard cases. It becomes almost 20, but uh, certainly 30 minutes, even including the detachments and stuff as an average makes sense. I, I love the shark skin. That's been a, a really tremendous advance. And, and I, I don't, I don't say this easily because uh up until then, there have been a whole lot of forceps I've liked, uh, and your ILM forcep was my go-to, and I agree with you about the disposable idea. When, when we first went predominantly disposable on forceps, I had some, some doubts and some skepticism about what the quality might be, the rigidity, the grabbing, and not only has it been good, it's been better, and it's been better by a lot, and the shark skin has been a tremendous advance. I uh, just share with you, I did a case this morning, right. Niall M. Peel, uh, the fellow was with me, and uh, I had him uh, do that portion of the case, and uh, he asked for a loop, and I said, no, no, the, just take the forcep and pinch and peel and do it my way, and I, trust me, you'll love this, and he, uh, he did it, and he felt great, and I, I really think that choice of that forcep also makes for great learning and a tremendous yeah. speed of learning curve for well, a young surgeon little story about that that kind of speaks to the innovation. So the flex loop, uh, we have brilliant engineers in Chef Housing. It's this, the, the watchmaking area of Switzerland. So uh, these guys are, it's the closest I've come to going to Santa's workshop, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just a cobblestone town. You've got this small factory and these brilliant engineers and they come up with the flex loop having those 82 teeth, right? 
Well, they essentially put those on the end of the forceps yeah. with shark skin. And it actually, when you magnify that, it looks like shark skin. It does. And that's why we call it that. And I defy you to ask a retina specialist already in, in like less than a year, everyone knows what shark skin is. So, yeah. you know, credit to their, I think to their innovation and understanding um, how to incrementally improve things uh, overall. So that's, a, I think, a great example. And the other thing I would say is, you know, we need to surround ourselves with surgeons that also have this infection like you do and Mark Humine and others that are really um, into innovation, so much so that you're in the, into venture capital and, and Mark is a, you know, serial prolific uh, inventor. But, you know, to start with, I met Steve Charles when he was 47 years old I won't say the year to give it away, but he's, <laughs> he's not that. That guy is relentless, yeah. brilliant. Then you go on down the list of, of the brilliant people. Yeah. I mean, you don't even have to use their last names, right? I mean, Baracol, D'Amico, Paco, Williams, Chang, Tano, yeah. Katanasono, Ogura, Figueroa, Kloss. And even the, the younger group, I, I know that you know a lot of these younger people like uh, – Wang, Miller, Gupta, uh, and so forth. I mean, there's just a lot of talented people out there, and I, d I don't think they realize what you had to go through. So they should they should thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about innovators and and your collaboration with surgeons, which is prolific, as we know, and specifically with Steve Charles and Stanley Chang in mind, who have helped Alcon in so many ways to get these machines and their, these systems where they are. How does uh, Alcon view finding those next young, not just great surgeons, but innovators? Uh, obviously you're going in the room and you're watching and you're listening, but are, is there a proactive way that the company or you are, are, are seeing that? So I think part of it is organic and then part of it is, is very analytical. So I'll be at meetings and I'll meet these people and we're, you know, we're looking for people that are um, very intelligent, not hard to find. Uh, so the separation is difficult, but you can find the people that are, they're humble. They're very curious. I think the curiosity is a key thing. And um, people get interested in certain things that I'm very interested in. So example, Steve Houston, he's in private practice in Orlando. He's very interested in telemedicine. And so am I, we have done a great job in the operating room and, you know, continue to innovate there. There's still room for improvement but you want to pivot also to the office. What else can we do in the office? And then COVID has kind of precipitate, precipitated this telemedicine uh, that I was already pursuing and, and found him and others like John Miller that are interested in this area. And so, uh, you know, I think if you pull back and, and you look at the kind of the phases we've gone through, the first phase in my career was electromechanical. The instruments were not very good. The electronics, I mean, the, the STTO, the Series 10,000 Oculum, had a 286 processor in it. Mm. I have children's toys that are yeah. more prolific than that. Yeah, for sure. The yeah. iPhone, for sure. Then you saw the biological revolution, right? Sure. Macigen. Yeah. Right? Bastin, Lucentis. Yeah. Amazing. 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 Revolutionary. And they're not, and they're not done. Uh, but now we really are heading into this this digital thing with ingenuity and then I think telemedicine making you more efficient in the office. And I don't want to lose the patient. You know, I want to go back to that patient surgeon Alcon Paul, you know, strategy. And uh, so that we can make people more efficient. But at the same time, I think we need to bring in technologies that help improve vision. So can we have devices? And I know we'll talk about unmet needs, but can we have devices for dry MD. I'm not super thrilled with all the clinical trials for geographic atrophy. I think if they're successful, the outcome is going to be unsatisfying to the patient. So can we get in front of that and, and prevent progression from intermediate to advanced AMD? Um, and so, look, I mean, I applaud anybody who's trying to innovate, but I think we need to, to get in front of some of these really challenging diseases. You're talking about technology and technology is clearly going to play a role in all these diseases and without question in how we practice all of medicine, but particularly our field. And I agree 
with your premise, if, if this is the premise you were making, it's not uh, mutually exclusive at all that making us more efficient, fast, uh, productive, that is good for the patients too, because nothing worse for the patients than when they come into the office and sit three and a half hours to get a right. five minute injection. And technology can make us a lot better at that service. And that has great impacts on the psychology and the health of the patient even directly. But since we're on technology, and one of them is something that's near and dear to you, I know, and I've been using and I'm getting my feet wet with it more and more is Ingenuity. You mentioned it. I'd like to talk about it a little bit. Give sure. us a little bit of the, since this is kind of your newest and most exciting recent technology, and it fits right in with our discussion about how can the office be better? Yes, this is a surgical tool, but the conceptualization of these different technologies can be applied in different areas, as you know. What is the history on the Ingenuity? How did you come to view it? I believe it was an acquisition originally, right. and where do you see it going from here? Yeah, so it was really interesting. Um, I was still uh, Vice President in R&D, um, leading the technical side of acquisitions called R&D Alliance, and then generally on the R&D leadership team. But that was my primary focus, and I ran into this company called True Vision. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, everything's going digital. This is very obvious to me that I looked at the analog microscope and I first I realized that it was made for cataract surgery, right? Fixed Z-axis, yep. you know, we can't see in the periphery. It's all analog. And um, I thought, well, everything's going digital. Let me take a look at what these guys are doing. I started asking lots of questions. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, great people there, brilliant, uh, Burton Tripathi, the, who's the CEO, now works for us, um, Mark Mayer and Chad Scarlett, um, great uh, marketing ambassadors uh, in teaching me the technology. Uh, and ultimately, I said, man, this is, number one, I think they're in the wrong area. They were trying to bring it into cataract surgery first, yeah. but it had HDR, right? It had greater magnification and depth of field. And I theorized that we could put a lot less light in the eye. So I called up Praveen Dougal because, you know, Praveen, he's a, he's a bright guy and he gets bored easily. And I think he was bored. And I said, Hey, you want to, you want to try this? It's, you know, it's, it's approved. And um, I knew that if he could peel the ILM, we we're in business. He peeled the ILM and he was bouncing around the OR all day, happy as a clam. He never used anything since. Huh. You know, he's a, he got it immediately. And that, it actually kind of strikes me that some people don't say, hey, it's digital. It, there's a lot you can do with that. And, and one of the things is data fusion, right? So taking the constellation parameters and putting them where you can see them, I mean, you wouldn't think of buying a car without the speedometer, tachometer, and right. the fuel gauge, and you're doing something a lot more complicated than driving, right? Yeah. And so that, that was the low-lying fruit, and we, we did that pretty easily. We're doing that now with Centurion and moving on into cataract surgery. Uh, but it turns out all those things came true, that it's actually better visualization. And I think that really, I would say to retina specialists out there, if you want a brighter future, invest in Ingenuity. The more you, money you guys put into that by buying it and supporting it, the more that we can put into it and develop it. And there's a lot, a lot of runway there. I think the analog microscope companies, the innovation was very flat because they didn't really pursue digital technologies. I mean, they have great glass, uh, great optics, uh, but, and great illumination sources. But that, you know, it's a very flat, you know, the microscope's been around for uh, almost 500 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't really improve that much. So I think that is a, a, a good thing of looking at something and saying, hey, let's reimagine visualization. Going back to one of the first things I said, you need a great surgeon, great surgical tools, which took about 30 years to get there. But you need great visualization. And uh, there's still a long way we can go there. And so I look forward to, to doing that. We're coming out with the 1.4 soft, software that, has a Centurion and Aura, which is a technology that allows you to help select the proper lens and uh, orientation for those torque lenses. Uh, and it's picture in picture. Um, you know, we've looked at endoscopes uh, coming onto there and other technologies, adaptive optics and things like that. So, I mean, the sky's really the limit there. And um, we always say, you know, when you guys aren't around, well, who's the best surgeon? 
And I think some people say, oh, so-and-so has great hands. And we kind of scoff at that a little bit. We think it's the people who can do great surgery when their view isn't very good. Yeah, yeah. That, that is the biggest challenge in yeah. vitreo retinal surgery, there's no doubt. And we talk about that in yeah. our casual over a cup of coffee conversation. And it's what sort of strikes fear into us when we go to a new facility, uh, an outlying facility where we don't have all, all of our help and uh, we're worried the microscope might not be up to snuff. Do you, and I don't want to put you on the spot and you, okay. you don't have to guess, but do you foresee, or is your hope, is your, uh, uh, maybe it's your assumption that ingenuity and flat screen 3D monitoring will replace the microscope out and out in a certain period of time for our type of surgery? Yeah, there's some inflection points that I know about because you're a public company. I can't really be forward uh, looking too much or I'll get in trouble, but uh, <laughs> we don't want that. There's going to be some inflection points. And I guess what I would advise is that, that you get into the, the area now and start learning. I think every teaching institution should have an ingenuity. Uh, it's certainly going to take off. The other thing is, listen, I don't want to ask you personally, but I know this that about 70% of surgeons in, in retina at some point in their careers have neck, you know, cervical spine issues. Yeah. And, you know, the positioning that you can get when you're doing ingenuity versus this, this you know, flat back, rigid, head not moving side to side, uh, it's got to not only wear on you mechanically over time, and the data shows that, but even on a, on a daily basis, you know, being in a more relaxed position is got to be healthier for you and, and career extending. So no that, and I, if nothing I, else, I personally you know, experienced it and I, I've been using the ingenuity. We did fortunately through you and others uh, at Alcon had a chance to test drive it way in the very early stages. And uh, I loved it from the first get go. And, and by by bad luck, if it turned out to be good luck, the day that we were test driving it, this is many moons ago when it was still under the other company, um, I had a very tough PBR case and it was the only case I had, but I really wanted to use the technology. And we went ahead and set it up and I did the whole case as my first case and it was amazing. And I'm told by one of my partners who is now using it uh, uh, 100%, I think, uh, that ILM peeling is even better. I have not uh, done that personally yet. I'm using it for a lot of cases and I'm going to advance to doing the ILM peeling, but he believes that the digital uh, enhancements have made the ILM peeling even better, not equivalent to. Yeah, you know, I actually had a, a, a fellow send me a, a video one day and it said, hey, I've been peeling uh, the ILM on Ingenuity and it's really awesome. He goes, I'm a little afraid because tomorrow I actually have to do it with a microscope. <laughs> wow, times have changed, haven't yeah. they? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you have tremendous magnification, like 50% more, right? Yeah. yeah. ILM's three microns thick or so. And, um, you know, it's amazing that you guys can do that, especially that you could do it with an, an analog microscope. So, um, yeah, I mean, from the mouth of babes, I think that that really it's it's easier. Uh, it's probably a little bit safer, and then you combine that with something like shark skin because these are independent innovations, but they work together very well, right? Sure. Um, and I, I think the depth of the field is kind of a precursor to um, you know autofocus. Um, so with that greater depth of field, more things are in focus. You can see better. So I mean, it's just. Uh, really amazing technology. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to, to get that technology and, and bring it into retina, but now it's, it's rolling into cataract surgery as well. We're excited about that. I would say one last thing on that is that in, in the COVID world, you know, a lot of people are wanting to, to wear a full face mask to protect themselves from the patient. You know, the, the testing and then the patient showing up is not really optimal. They're two or three days usually if, if they're tested at all. And, um, we're now able to use 3D with a full face mask that you really would have trouble using up against the oculars of a, of a microscope. And beyond that, I think everyone can get a little bit further away, uh, in a kind of social distancing in the operating room. So, uh, an excellent point. I hadn't even considered that the face mask issue. Yes, it's impossible to do a slit lamp exam or a microscopic surgery with the face mask. It's a great yeah. point. Before you try it, I need to let you know that, that uh, my, my refringence causes a problem or double refraction. So 
if you put on a full face mask and wear the 3D glasses underneath, it, it will not be in 3D. So we've actually uh, developed some where the, the 3D film goes on, you can attach to the outside of the face shield. So just FYI, everybody out there, um, that's in play, so. That's why you guys are playing chess when we're all playing checkers. That's impressive. I, I wouldn't have even thought of that. Well, we didn't think of it either until someone called us. So just okay. in, all, in all humility, uh, we're just reacted to that one. With regard, what, uh, one final area I want to give you a chance to speak to and I want to hear your thoughts on before we close. What about the unmet needs? What, what do you see individually or what does your company see as the next frontiers or where are areas that you can help the ophthalmology world to treat patients? Yeah, and I think we covered a big one, visualization and surgery, so we won't go down that path again. Um, um, and I, to me, the message is it's, you know, you think of Alcon in the OR, but office as well is what we really need to do. So, but in the OR, I still think we need better tamponades. Uh, having face down positioning of, of multiple days is not ideal. Uh, silicone oil requiring another procedure to remove it that's really unacceptable and that's really on us because um, we've been so focused on other things and those are really difficult things. They're almost like developing a drug, right? Yeah. But there's multiple vitreous substitutes out there and we have our own technologies and we're looking at all of them. We're kind of agnostic, right? We, we're, we're based on data and if, uh, you know, if, uh, if a vitreous substitute from, uh, I think, you know, Picus, uh, Tony and Tommy out there in Massachusetts, if there's works, you know, we're interested in that. Or if, you know, if we develop something internal and we just need to decide, you know, which is best. And there are several companies in that area. We're looking at all of them, but um, you know, we'll see, but we need to solve those problems going back to patient first. So face down positioning with gas or another procedure is unacceptable. Yeah, that's, I think better tamponade, would be amazing. And it is kind of remarkable that we haven't done much in that area in the last 20 or 25 years for those two reasons, as well as that may be something that could be the piece of the puzzle that raises our success rates with retinal detachment surgery. As you know, there's a known failure rate, even with what seems to be perfect surgery and a compliant patient and an excellent surgeon, we still have failures. So maybe some better tamponading agents would even increase our success rate in primary surgery of retinal detachment. That would be awesome. And I'm glad you're thinking about it. Yeah, we have some, some, um, a couple different devices coming up in that area for better, better gas mixing. Um, I think also in, in some other next generation tamponade that solves those two problems. So, you know, uh, I think that's one area. I think beyond that, really, you know, PVR, right? Yeah. Who's doing anything about that? It turns out that there are people, and um, that's always been on my radar list, that or some type of neuroprotective. So I think one of the messages, don't think of us as a surgical company. We used to be the leaders in pharma, and, you know, that is now largely with Novartis. But, uh, you know, we want to look at technologies to solve the problems for the patient and the surgeon and so forth. So I'm interested in, in solving the PVR issue, um, having neuroprotective. Um, you know what? We're, you are a what? You're a vitro retinal surgeon, right? Yeah. So, you that's know, what they tell me. That's what they tell you. Uh, I've heard you're pretty good. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it, for retina, we have OCT, right? Amazing. Yeah. And that came around, you know, 1999-ish. But um, what do we have for vitreous? Yeah, nothing. How about a vitreous diagnostic that is as awesome as, you know, OCT is? I mean, that's an area, right? Yeah. Um, and then in general, office therapeutics, and we've talked about remote virtual, but what about dry AMD? You know, dry AMD, huge unmet need. touched on that. And, uh, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really thrilled with what the outcomes might be for drugs targeted at GA. You know, I, you know, I love uh, what those people are doing, Cedric Francois and others, but, uh, you know, it's going to be unsatisfying to the patient. Yeah, so. they, won't, they won't perceive it as a huge win to have a 20 or 30% reduction in 
the speed of advance of the disease. You are correct. I do a lot yeah. of clinical trials. Here's the, here, here's it's hard the, to understand, but it, your, that your is vision, what it will be. Yeah, your vision's declining, but not as fast as it would have. Exactly. Exactly. That is, that's exactly. a hard message to give to patients. We do give it to them. We do our best to educate them as to why that's relevant, but you're a hundred percent right on, on its face. That will not be a, a great pleasure for the patient well, to hear. To use an analogy, you've got like a perfect haircut, but if somebody gave you a bad haircut and, and then said, hey, it's a good thing you didn't go down the street and get a worse haircut. <laughs> and get injured. <laughs> yeah. So um, I do think, you know, fo seriously focusing on dry AMD, we're going to have to have an open mind because there may, or may be drugs that uh, can work earlier on and then it becomes a benefit risk ratio. Are you going to do an intravitreal injection to somebody who is, right? So we had retain. I was on the retain team back in the early 2000s. That didn't work out, but that was a, that was a shot in the right direction. So we're going to have to keep an open mind. There's some electro stem um, devices that have worked in other parts of the body. Those are interesting. Uh, and then beyond that, some light therapy things, and they sound crazy, but you know, they're, they're probably, as you look at them closer, one of them might work. So we, we need to keep an open mind and uh, really, I think, try, try to uh, prevent these, you know, diseases from progressing to a no-win situation. Everything's crazy until it's not. Uh, right. Paul, this has been a pleasure. And I, I want to thank you. And uh, again, for the listeners, Paul Hallen, Global Head at Alcon for Retina and Glaucoma. We talked primarily, of course, about Retina for obvious reasons. It's the Retina podcast. But I want to thank you for coming on. You're a good friend. Uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude as uh, vitreo retinal surgeons for what you have personally done and what your company has done for our specialty. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I think at this point, I'd really like to thank a lot of people uh, behind this whole effort. And uh, we have great R&D engineers out in California, Gary Sorensen, Sheila Chin, they're, they're leading uh, in areas that will come uh, in the future, James Chan, Grace Liao. And then on my team, people like, uh, I don't know if you know, Michael Cardamone, Russ Finley, Wes Eldon, Amy Paddock, and some blasts from the past, Mark Forche. I don't know how his yeah. name come up, and people like Dave Kent, Lancaster, Tom D. Palermo, Nicole Sheeler. Yeah. So if you don't know all those people, I know that someone in your audience does. So. Oh, yeah. No, I, I know most of those names and, and know a lot of those people uh, personally or have known them and uh, great people. I'm glad you listed them. Feel free. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to recognize yeah. because they've all made great contributions. And, and I kind of delayed in saying this just to tease him, but Patrick Sad's good, good friend and right hand man. Didn't mention him purposely, so he would he would sweat a little bit. But Patrick, <laughs> made him wait it out. True, true story. Patrick said actually launched the constellation as I exited into sales to get uh, head of sales uh, experience there for a while. So anyway, it takes a takes team effort and also great leaders and supporters. You know, in the last several years, we've gotten more support from people like uh, you know our CEO David Endicott, uh, Michael Honest Check, and Jeanette Bankas and uh in frank lavalier in r d so and of course i'll end with none of this possible without the great steve charles yeah yeah <laughs> we agree that's all i got thank you thanks that's plenty man thank you for coming on i'm thank sure you. the listeners will have gained a lot of interesting tidbits from this conversation i appreciate it you bet take thank care you. Thanks for joining us for this episode and be sure to register for the OIS Retina Innovation Showcase on OIS.net. Stay tuned for next week's OIS podcast when Dr. Asan Sadri interviews Ken Mandel, CEO of Layer Bio.